Hi, everyone. My name is Bobby Saferstein, JDCA's Director of Programming and Strategy, and thank you for joining the Jewish Democratic Council of America in marking one year since January 6th. I want to thank Hillel Tigay for performing with us today, and I'd now like to turn it over to JDCA CEO, Haley Soifer. Today is a dark and solemn day marking one year since an unprecedented attack not only on the US Capitol, but on the fabric of our democracy with the clear intention of undermining the peaceful transfer of power. What began as Donald Trump's alignment with and refusal to denounce white supremacy evolved into explicit incitement of those very extremists, culminating with the Proud Boys and others heeding Donald Trump's call to stand back and stand by and stop the certification of the 2020 election. And it wasn't just the extremists who stormed the Capitol that day who heeded his call. Let us not forget that hours after the deadly attack on their own lives, 147 Republicans voted against certifying the results of the 2020 election. Shame on them all. We all remember where we were last year on January 6th, and soon we will hear from lawmakers who were in the Senate and House chambers. But it is also incumbent on us to remember that Donald Trump's attack on our democracy did not begin on that day. And unfortunately, it continues as we speak with ubiquitous Republican-led efforts to subvert our democracy and suppress the right to vote in nearly every state in the country. The lessons of January 6th are clear. Our democracy is not guaranteed. It must be protected and defended, and those who attack it must be held accountable. That is why the Jewish Democratic Council of America, along with our Democratic partners in the White House and in Congress and throughout the country, all of you, are recommitting to defending our democracy today with action and words. And it's not just about reflection. We are calling for action, for Congress to pass the Freedom to Vote Act, and for the Senate to reform or abolish the filibuster in order to do so. And the link for all of you to join us, to write to your members of Congress with five clear steps they can take to defend our democracy will be posted in the chat and shared with all of you. Please join us in taking action today and share. At our program, we will hear from a range of voices. The first portion of today's event will focus on reflections with members of Congress who were in the Senate and House on January 6th, followed by a forward-looking discussion of what we can all do to protect our democracy. And first, we'll hear from my Senator from Maryland, Ben Cardin. Thank you so much for joining us, Senator Cardin. We're hoping that you can share your reflections about what transpired one year ago today and how you view this attack on our democracy and your efforts and others to protect it through a Jewish lens. Well, Haley, first of all, thank you so much for bringing us together on this one year anniversary of the insurrection on January the 6th under the uh, banner now, the Jewish Democratic Council of America, we have a chance to reflect and we thank you for that. On January 6th last year, I was on the Senate floor when the insurrectionists entered the capital of the United States and were literally banging on our doors. Uh, Vice President Pence uh, was taken out of the chamber. We were told to stay away from the doors. We knew that there had been gunshots. We were extremely concerned, not just about our safety, because we knew that this attack was not on the Capitol, was not on the members of the Senate. It was on our democracy itself. Uh, we were hurried uh, to a safe place, and then we saw on the monitors exactly what was happening in the Capitol, and we were shocked. And, and Haley, you're right. Uh, there were members of the Republican Party on that day that could have taken the right action in regards to certification, and they did not. But I want to tell you, I was huddled with a lot of members of the United States Senate, both Democrats and Republicans, who expressed shock about what was happening, and were committed to take steps in order to protect our democracy. But as time went on, we saw more and more of our Republican colleagues show loyalty to Donald Trump rather than protecting our democracy. And that is a frightening message as we now see actions being taken in the state legislatures around the nation to diminish the right of vote. They are aimed at those that they think will not vote for them trying to make it more difficult for those individuals to vote. Another assault on our democracy. 
We need to protect our democratic institutions. And quite frankly, there's only one party that's doing that today, and that's the Democratic Party. And yes, we need to pass the, the bills that you referred to, the, the Freedom to Vote Act, that would protect your right to be able to cast your ballots. Make no mistake about it. These Republican legislatures are trying to make it more difficult for people to vote that they think will vote for their opponents. Look where the long lines are on election day, and you'll see that they're in minority communities. They're near where young people vote because they're more likely to vote for Democrats than Republicans, and that's why Republican legislatures are trying to make it more difficult for them to be able to vote. Taking away the right to vote by mail. Who, who has the challenges to vote in person? Those who can't afford childcare, those are more likely, again, as Republicans see it, to vote for their opponents. We have to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act because of the decision of the Supreme Court in regards to the pre-certification issues dealing with legislatures that have uh, passed laws that make it more difficult for people to vote. We're talking about legislation in these two bills that will protect your right to vote, give basic protection to voting by mail, deal with political gerrymandering, deal with dark money, deal with the right of returning citizens to be able to vote. These are bills that were passed right after the Civil War, the Jim Crow laws that we need to, to repeal today. And you're absolutely right. We saw how fragile our democracy was one year ago today. We need to take steps to protect our democracy. And we cannot allow the filibuster in the United States Senate to prevent that from happening. We need to return the United States Senate to what it historically has done debate and vote on issues. The Senate needs to take up the voting rights bills. They need to debate that, offer amendments, vote on amendments. But at the end of the day, we need to vote by a majority on those issues. And we have enough votes to protect the rights to vote under a, under a majority vote, but not under the filibuster rules that have been abused by the Republicans in the Senate. It's way past time that we restore the United States Senate to its proper position and allow us to vote on these issues. So I thank you for bringing us here today to reflect. Yes, we know where we were a year ago. We know that we were at risk. We know our democracy was at risk. We need to protect our democracy. We need to take action. We need to protect the right to vote. Thank you so much, Senator Cardin, for being with us. It's now my honor to introduce Rabbi Sharon Brous, the senior and founding rabbi of ICAR in Los Angeles. Rabbi Brous, Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Haley and Bobby, and thank you, Senator Cardin. You know, as we've been approaching this day, the anniversary of the violent breach of our capital, I have been thinking about how we as Jews mark time. Our calendar is punctuated by commemorations throughout the year, mostly of times throughout history when our enemies tried to destroy us and sometimes when they nearly succeeded. So in the darkest days of winter, we light candles and sing and spin dreidels, remembering the victory of a small band of Jewish warriors over the Greek Syrian oppressors. And in the spring, we dress up in costumes and we drink too much, celebrating our narrow escape from the Persian leader's decree of genocide against us. But then in the heat of summer, we sit on the ground and we fast and we read lamentations and we remember the Chorban, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the murder and exile and forced enslavement of our people. Here, there's no great victory to celebrate. There are only tears. The only redemptive note is that we weren't completely annihilated. So I wonder in the years ahead, how we'll remember this day? How we'll remember January 6th? Will this be a celebration a tragedy narrowly averted, truth over lies, decency over demagoguery? Will this be the beginning of a new era of justice and dignity, equity and equality? Will January 6th be seen by our children as the birth pangs of a new America, the one that's been waiting to be born for hundreds of years? I wonder if the breach of the perimeter and what it revealed to us uh, about us as a nation will, will usher in a new kind of moral clarity about the heresy of white supremacy and the mortal danger that it poses to our country. Will this be remembered as the moment that we collectively abandoned the false moral narrative that prioritizes profit over people and some people over others, instead affirming that every single person deserves to live in full dignity? Or in the years ahead, Will our children sit on the ground and fast and lament on this day, 
the harbinger of the end of democracy, the time that violent white nationalism took center stage before a morally confused nation as lawmakers and leaders and millions of Americans responded with a shrug. Will our children weep as they recall the way that the coup that began on January 6th was completed over the course of the next couple of years through voter suppression and other legal and extra legal means? Will this day be remembered as the day that awakened America from its slumber and called us to the better angels of our nature? Or will it be remembered as the day that power, corruption, and greed officially won? We don't yet know. That answer depends on all of us, on the lawmakers and the journalists and the citizens and the students and teachers and preachers. What we do now matters. It all matters. So today we tell the truth. Today we speak not only of what happened years ago, but also about the conditions that allowed for the sickness to spread in the body politic. Today we remember not only how many people breached the walls, but we commit to holding responsible every single person who fueled the lie that drove them there in the first place. Today we not only call out the violence, but we name it as the terrorist threat that it is. We don't only condemn what happened, but we commit together to decisive, dramatic action to ensure that the past won't be precedent. Today, we gather not only to commemorate what we've lost, but also to voice with grave urgency the lessons that must be learned as we face a dangerous and uncertain future. Remember, this chapter of history is yet to be written, and how it ends is entirely up to us. Thank you, Rabbi Browse, for those words as we move throughout the program and Mark today. I'd now like to welcome back JDCA CEO Haley Soifer to speak with our next guests. Haley. Thank you, Bobby. First, we'd like to welcome Representative Jamie Raskin, who represents Maryland's 8th Congressional District and was recently the recipient of JDCA's inaugural Defender of Democracy Award for his tireless selfless and ongoing efforts to defend our democracy and further our Jewish values. Congressman, one year ago today, you started your day heroically at the Capitol with your family to ensure the certification of our presidential election and the peaceful transfer of power. Hours later, your children found themselves hiding under a desk in the Capitol while you were sheltering with other House members amid a violent insurrection. Can you please share with us your experience from that day and lessons that we can all learn from it as we join you in our efforts to defend our democracy? Haley, hey, thank you so much for having me and greetings to all my friends out there. Um, it is a, a somber and melancholy day, but I also want us to focus on um, the heroes of January 6th, the cops like Officer Dunn, my constituent, Officer Fanon, who was beaten nearly to death, who had a heart attack, who was being tased with his own taser and begged for mercy, basically saying he had four girls at home and uh, his life was spared at the last minute. Um, Officer Hodges, who was caught in the doorway, Officer Gunnell, um, so many cops who put their lives on the line to save members of Congress, to protect the peaceful transfer of power that we had hoped for, and to save our democracy. Um, and, uh, and I want to salute also all the staffers, including the ones who saved the mahogany boxes with the Electoral College votes inside them. And I want to salute my colleagues who came back in uh, in the middle of the night uh, at two, three in the morning, uh, despite the fact that the security situation was still radically unsettled and unstable uh, and insisted on completing the counting of Electoral College votes. And uh, Mike Pence was a hero on that day because he refused to buckle under to Donald Trump's uh, demands that he... Uh, reject electoral college votes unilaterally, unlawfully from Pennsylvania, Arizona, and Georgia. So there were a lot of people who stood up for us, and I don't want people to forget that we won. Democracy survived both an attempt at a coup uh, run out of the White House by Donald Trump and Roger Stone and Steve Bannon, and also a violent insurrection 
that ended up wounding and injuring 150 cops. And a lot of those officers were uh, Afghan and Iraqi war vets who said they had never seen bloodshed and mayhem like the kind that was unleashed upon us. So um, I want to celebrate the heroes of the day, and I want us to try to recapture that spirit of resolve and determination that they had on that day for us going forward to fortify our democratic institutions. Great, thank you so much, Congressman. And since that day, you have been leading the charge in efforts to defend our democracy against ongoing Republican attacks against it. Can you talk a bit about those efforts and how we can all take action with you? Yeah, well, you know, uh, part of it, of course, is we need to uh, arrive at the truth of what happened. I mean, the, the day's events, I divide into three categories of activity, three rings. At the outer ring, we had a mass wild demonstration called by Donald Trump, which quickly turned into a riot. Um, in the middle ring, in the, the center ring, we had the insurrectionists, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, the Aryan Nations, the Ku Klux Klan, the First Amendment Praetorian, the uh, militia, groups, the QAnon networks, these people had been training for battle against us. And uh, they were the first ones to come in. They punched out the windows, the ones that they seemed to know were unfortified. Um, and they led the assault on the building and laid siege to the building. They also were the first ones to begin the violent assault against the officers and then set the template for what the rioting, marauding uh, mob would proceed to do. But at the very inner ring, we found the scariest action of all. We saw Donald Trump, Steve Bannon, Roger Stone, uh, and uh, the coterie of uh, inner advisors, people like Michael Flynn, engaged in a coup. And a coup is a strange word in American political parlance because we don't have experience with coups in our history. And we think of a coup as something that takes place against a president, but this was a coup organized by the president against the vice president. And after failing to get Republican legislatures just to void out election results and install Trump electoral college slates, after failing to intimidate election officials like Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, to force him just to find 11,781 votes for Trump. After all of that failed, the whole effort was trained on Mike Pence, could they get Pence to declare lawless, extra-constitutional power to nullify the votes of state uh, electoral college um, uh, certificates that had been sent in by the governors from those states? And it had never been done before. And Pence refused to do it. And he sent out a memo to all of us right before we began our session at 1 o'clock on that day. And he said he did not have the power to do what Donald Trump was asking him to do. And that, of course, infuriated um, the mob. Um, but the point was, if they could get him to do that, Biden's electoral college vote total would fall from 306 to, to below 270. And at that point, under the 12th Amendment to the Constitution, immediately the House is supposed to resolve into a so-called contingent election in which we would vote and decide on who's the president. And you ask why Trump would try to get it all forced in to the House. Well, under the 12th Amendment, we vote not one member one vote, but one state one vote in one of these presidential elections. And they had 27 state delegations under the GOP thumb after the uh, congressional elections. We had only 22 and one Pennsylvania was split down the middle. So even if they lost the at-large rep from Wyoming, Liz Cheney, which I think they would have, they still had 26 votes in the bag simply to declare Donald Trump the president. And at that point, he was prepared, I think, to invoke the Insurrection Act to declare something like martial law, and then finally to call in the National Guard to put down the violence and the chaos he had unleashed against us. That was the plan in the central inner ring of the activity. So we had a riot surrounding an insurrection, surrounding a coup. And that's what we were up against on January the 6th. 
Thank you so much, Congressman. We are so proud to have uh, bestowed on you this Defender of Democracy Award. You truly are one of the leading defenders of democracy in our country, and we are proud to call you a friend, and we're so grateful for your tireless uh, efforts in Congress. Thank you. Well, I'm honored to receive it. I don't know if I deserve it at all, but I will work to deserve it every single day because we have no more precious inheritance in our country than the democracy itself. And it's not a surefire thing. It's no guarantee there are forces out there that would put their own power above the constitutional design and the rights of the people. So um, it's going to take all of us every day vigilantly fighting to defend our institutions. Absolutely. And thank you for your efforts. We would now like to welcome Representative Susan Wild, who serves Pennsylvania's 7th Congressional District and is completing her second term in Congress. Congresswoman, we have all seen the photos of you and Jason Crow, representative from Colorado's 6th District, on the ground in that House chamber. And you recently wrote in the Washington Post, I believe it was published last night, that you will never unhear the sound of a gunshot, gunshot just outside the House chamber or the mob trying to break down the doors. Can you tell us a bit about your experience that day and the lessons that we should all learn going forward to protect our democracy? Well, thank you, Haley. Shalom, my friends. And um, let me just say that following Jamie Raskin is never the desired uh, position in the speaking lineup. So, um, but but I am honored to to be with him and to be his colleague. And there is nobody that I can think of who is more deserving of the Defender of Democracy Award. Um, <clears throat> It, you know, here I am in Washington, it's January 6th, a year later, and I have to tell you that as I drove down from Pennsylvania last night, I had a sense of exhilaration and happiness that I was returning to Washington, um, which might sound strange, but it actually, to me, is very affirming of the fact that all of us who were involved on January 6th have stayed the course and recommitted ourselves to um, defending our democracy and making sure that the reasons that we came to Congress to begin with are not thwarted by an unruly mob, by people on the other side of the aisle, or by a former president. That day was incredibly difficult, stressful. The picture that is now, I guess, iconic I don't remember being in that position. I don't remember having that picture taken, but I, what I do remember is Jason Crow. And I, I didn't even know Jason was behind me at that moment in time. I, was, um, I had just gotten off a FaceTime call with my two adult children. And it would be fair to say that I had a complete and utter panic attack for the first time in my life. I didn't even realize at the time that's what I was having. It wasn't until I later consulted with medical professionals, mostly to make sure that I wasn't having a heart attack, that I realized that what it was was a panic attack. And there in probably my worst hour that I can remember, um, I heard the very calm and soothing voice and felt the hand of Jason Crow behind me um, saying, it's going to be all right. You're, go you're going to be all right. And I can't, you know, <laughs> we've all heard uh, Mr. Rogers' famous adage of look for the helpers. If you look for them, you will find them. They will be there. And nothing brings that saying home more to me than what happened that day. Um, since then, Jason has, I, I was always friends with Jason before that day. He has turned into my um, my rock. He's been there for me every single time I have needed him. And he's just a constant reminder to me of the good that there is in this world and in our Democratic caucus, quite honestly. Not only because of the actions of Jason, but I have to tell you that this caucus enjoys, and this is something that many people aren't aware of on the outs in the outside world, a great de deal of camaraderie, 
and friendship and moral support for one another. That's the saying of, I've got your back. Every member of the Democratic Caucus has one another's back, even when we have differences of opinion about policy. And it's truly a sight to behold. And so the only thing I'm going to say at, in conclusion is that I think it's really important that we look forward, not back. Not to say that we should forget history. Obviously, we cannot forget history. That would be our undoing. But we have to look forward and make sure that we are digging deep within ourselves. And that means all of us on this call. It means all of us who think we are generally pretty good people anyway, but to dig even deeper, to find the best that we can give the rest of the world to our neighbors, even those with whom we disagree and find the areas of commonality, find what brings us together and do it in the name of democracy, do it in the name of our children and our grandchildren and generations to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, and thank you for the piece that you uh, wrote in the post. We posted in the chat for everyone to see. It's extremely powerful, not just reflecting on that day, but also what we can all do uh, going forward. So thank you for that. Okay, I see that we have Representative Mike Levin from California. Thank you for joining us, Congressman. You represent California's 49th Congressional District and you're completing your second term in office. Uh, Congressman, you are, you are the last uh, speaker today that's gonna join us in this half where we talk about reflections from that day. And we've heard from many members to talk about what it was like to be in those chambers, but I'm actually interested in hearing from you about what it was like to return to the chamber to certify the election after hours of sheltering amid the insurrection. And of course, we know that 147 of your Republican colleagues refused to certify the election that day. But what was it like to return to the House chamber? Well, it was surreal, uh, Haley. And, and first, I just want to thank you and, and JDCA and, and Rabbi for your words, Senator Cardin, uh, Jamie and, and Susan. Hope everybody goes and gets Jamie's book. Uh, I don't know if he can say that, but I can say that. And also I saw uh, Brad and, and Kathy. It's just an honor to, to serve with you and, and want to uh, associate myself with, uh, with Susan's uh, comments that uh, despite what you may read or hear, we're, we're really all in this together and we, we try to be there for one another uh, as part of the House Democratic Caucus. Uh, it was uh, an awful, awful day. Uh, Haley, and uh, to your question, I arrived that morning prepared to uphold uh, my oath of office, as we all uh, did, to uh, certify the results uh, of the election. And uh, I had in my office uh, the split screen watching uh, President, uh, then President Trump uh, and his remarks at the rally down the street uh, on one screen, and then watching my colleagues go state by state uh, through uh, the Electoral College uh, certification process on the other, and, and it was clear that something was very, very wrong. Um, and uh, in short order, uh, we decided to stay put uh, in, uh, in the Longworth building as opposed to going to the gallery. Um, I uh, can't imagine uh, the uh, extraordinary uh, uh, emotions that, that must be going through all of my colleagues today who, who were in the gallery. Uh, but uh, as I reflect on, on that day, I'm so happy that we did go back uh, later that evening. You know, we were basically stuck in the Capitol complex wherever we were for, I don't know, six hours or so, eight hours. And then I was very proud of the fact that we all did our duty. We upheld our constitutional responsibility and that we would not be deterred uh, by anyone, by any insurrectionists who would try to get in the way of our democracy. I guess I would just say three quick things, Haley. Uh, one is that we cannot forget uh, the bravery and the sacrifice of the Capitol Police, of the National Guard, of everybody who protected us on that day and in the days after that. Uh, we uh, lost five police officers, Capitol Police officers, as Jamie said, about 150 more were severely injured. Uh, tragically, um, those lost lives, their, their families, their, their entire futures have been impacted so uh, greatly by all of that. And uh, anybody uh, who says that they uh, are pro-law enforcement, uh, they ought to start uh, by acknowledging and respecting those law enforcement officers who lost their lives that day, uh, rather than um, you know, trying to have revisionist history. 
Uh, second, I would say uh, that uh, it's incredibly troubling that to this day, there are some, including some of our colleagues uh, on the Republican side who continue uh, this disinformation uh, to deny uh, the uh, presidency of Joe Biden uh, because it wasn't what they wanted. Uh, that's uh, you know not how democracy works. And, and ultimately, I, I think um, we have to choose collectively. We have to choose whether to heal or whether to continue to divide whether to put short-term partisan interests ahead of our nation or not. Uh, and it's very discouraging to, to see some of my colleagues who insist on spreading this disinformation uh, around 2020. I, I would just say to them, I don't think any of them are watching, but just in case, Haley, uh, I would just say to them, understand that your actions will be remembered uh, as some of the most shameful in our nation's history. Uh, but but uh, to my other colleagues, uh, Republicans, and Democrats alike, those who upheld their oath of office that day, those who continue to uphold uh, their office uh, to this day, um, I want to say thank you. Thank you for defending our democracy, and it's an honor to serve with all of you. And uh, my great hope is that we're going to be able to address the great challenges facing our nation uh, together, uh, where uh, we once again turn to what unites us, to our shared values, <clears throat> to our democracy, and ultimately to uh, a better day ahead. So uh, with that, Haley, I thank you for uh, convening us. I, I thank my colleagues for uh, sharing what's on their minds on this day. Uh, and uh, we're all going to reflect uh, and recognize that we must never allow a day like this to happen again. Thank you so much, Congressman Levin. I also want to thank Senator Cardin, Representatives Raskin and Wild for joining us today. I'm now going to turn it over to JDCA's board chair and former Congressman from Florida, Ron Klein, to lead the second half of this event where we look to the future and steps we can all take to defend our democracy. Over to you, Ron. Thank you, Haley. And thanks to all of our previous speakers, uh, really genuine, authentic, and, and from the heart. I also want to thank Haley and our entire team at JDCA for the great work you do on behalf of our organization and all of us throughout the country as Jewish Democrats. It's, it's clear that our country is facing a fundamental challenge, not from outside enemies or foreign adversaries, but from homegrown extremists bent on undermining our democracy. What is even more concerning is that these extremists have not only found a home in the Republican Party, but they have been welcomed into the Republican Party and now are part of its establishment and leadership. Despite Donald Trump's lies about the 2020 election, despite Donald Trump's incitement of a deadly insurrection one year ago today, Trump still is way ahead in the polling for the 2024 GOP presidential nomination. And more importantly, Republicans in Congress still consider him their leader. Numerous reports show a decline in democracy in the United States, and a poll released just this last week shows that 64% of Americans believe the U.S. democracy is in crisis and at risk of failing. Think about that. Unimaginable in our lifetimes or even a mere few years ago. These results are unacceptable, but if we don't take action and work to restore not only our democracy, but faith in our, in, in our democratic institutions as well, no one will. The good news is with your help, we can do it. And we have with us today, four members of Congress who are laser focused on protecting and strengthening our democracy. I'm gonna start this segment by welcoming Representative Brad Schneider who represents the 10th District of Illinois where he is serving his fourth term. He's a member of the House Committee on Ways and Means and House Committee on Foreign Affairs and is a leading voice in support of a strong US-Israel relationship. Congressman, you are known for doing your homework and thoroughly understanding the bills that Congress is considering. What exactly are Democrats doing in Congress to protect our democracy? And specifically, can you help explain the key provisions of the For the People Act and other voting rights pieces of legislation and how they will shore up our democracy? Reports show that Senator Schumer obviously is trying to bring this forward. And if he is able to change the filibuster rules, it will come before us in a vote in the Senate. So I think Americans do want to know specifically what is in it, if you can share that with us. Sure, Ron, thank you. And first, uh, let me uh, extend my gratitude to JDCA uh, and everyone joining us on this call today for uh, being a part of this um, marking of the, the first anniversary of uh, the attack on our Capitol on January 6th. It was an insurrection. It was the first time uh, 
in two centuries that the capital uh, had been occupied only a second time in our history. Uh, and it was an attack on uh, our, our democracy and a crime against uh, the Constitution, as others have said. It was an apex, apex moment. Uh, we beat it back, uh, but the struggle continues. The struggle existed before January 6th, and it carries on today, and, and we have to stay very well fo focused on, on it. I think what um, my, my colleague and dear friend Jimmy Raskin so elo eloquently said earlier about the three rings of attack in the plan um, uh, is, is, is worth noting. I want to make uh, sure you know, to highlight you had, had the people who were in the flash of the moment um, brought to Washington by the president, um, it's inspired, uh, led astray, however you want to describe it. But in that center ring, those extremists, the di different groups that were planning and organizing, actively engaged, they continue to plan and organize and, and, and uh, do everything they can with the intent of, of undermining who, what we are as a country and who we are as a people. And then obviously that, that center core. Um, we need to protect our democracy. And today, as we, we mark this uh, anniversary, uh, we will finish the day uh, raising the flags from half mast and, and remembering that uh, last year on January 6th, democracy held. And members of Congress returned to the chambers in the House and the Senate. We completed our appointed task by the Constitution, certified the election, and we continue this, this fight today. Uh, but the pedestal upon which our democracy stands uh, is the, the vote of the people. Everyone in this country should be confident that they can cast their vote safely and securely, that their vote will be accurately counted, and that the outcome of the election will reflect the will of the people. And so there are a number of bills. You mentioned them, the uh, uh, HR1 for the People Act, S1, I think, on the Senate side, uh, is uh, a bill that we've been working on for many years that will try to bring confidence back into the electoral process, to take big money out of the electoral process, uh, to put the vote and the selection of our representatives back into the hands uh, of the people. And uh, that is something that has passed the House, uh, unfortunately, is stalled in the Senate. Uh, the second HR4 is the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. This bill directly tackles the challenge created by the Supreme Court decision in uh, Shelby that rolled back the 1965 Voting Rights Act and uh, has allowed many states uh, that previously had to go through pre-certification to make sure that they were uh, providing the access to the vote to all of their citizens, to all US citizens, um, are, are now rolling that back. We're not just seeing voter suppression making it harder for people to vote, but we're seeing actions where states are, are trying to subvert the vote and, and undermine the counting of, of the votes. Um, on the Senate side, it's the Freedom to Vote Act. And my hope is that in the weeks and, and months ahead, in the very near term, we can come back together, House and Senate, and, and pass legislation to get to the president's desk that will ensure that everyone in this country can have the confidence that their vote is going to be cast, counted, and the, the outcome of the election will reflect the will of the people. Well, thank, thank you, Congressman, and we appreciate your leadership uh, on, on those issues. Uh, th those pieces of legislation are essential. I think all the policy things that are going on in Congress right now are also very important, but the fundamental uh, way we're going to accomplish anything is if we have a fair voting system, which everyone has the right to vote. Yeah, and, and if so, I can add one thing, Ron, just uh, sure. one more important thing is uh, it, it's not just the right to vote. We have to stand up to these extremists, to the terrorists who are domestic terrorists who are seeking to undermine who we are as a nation. Uh, we have legislation, House and Senate, I introduced with uh, Senator Durbin, uh, the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act, and hopefully we can pass that as well. Thank you. Congressman Schneider, be safe, be well, and we'll look forward to seeing you soon. You as um, well. Thank you. I'm going to make a little change in our programming, if we can. Uh, our next guest, uh, who's on a very tight schedule, um, uh, just was able to uh, make a, an adjustment in his schedule to join us, is Congressman Adam Schiff. Uh, Adam serves the California's 28th Congressional District. He's in his 11th term in the House of Representatives. He currently serves, as many of you know, as the chair of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. He led the House impeachment inquiry with, with uh, great um, uh, intelligence and, 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 uh, and, and work and worked with all sides and served as the lead impeachment manager during the Senate impeachment trial of Donald Trump. His most recent work is a book, uh, Midnight in Washington, which was released in October. And I do suggest you grab it as along with uh, Congressman Raskins, 
to understand uh, his perspective, which is our perspective. And it's met widespread acclaim. So thank you for writing that book for all of our, our, our evaluation. Representative Schiff, thank you for being here today. You recently wrote about how we almost lost our democracy in this book and still could. Tell us what are the lessons that we should all learn from January 6th? And most importantly, how can we apply these lessons to assure that this never happens again? Ron, uh, thank you for having me on. Um, I just came from the House floor where I stood in the same spot I stood a year ago uh, during the insurrection uh, when I was one of a, a small number of members asked to manage the opposition to the effort to decertify the election. And in talking to my colleagues on the House floor, um, I was uh, you know, so uh, discouraged to acknowledge that we are in a worse position today than we were a year ago, that our democracy is on more fragile ground now than it has ever been. Um, on that day, I think we all uh, hoped in its aftermath that we would finally move forward as a nation, repudiate uh, all the lies about the election that had given rise to that kind of violence. Uh, and here we are a year later uh, where the big lie is uh, as big as ever uh, and as much of a danger uh, to our democracy, not just that lie, but the, the more fulsome attack on the truth. Uh, that Joe Biden spoke about so uh, passionately earlier today. Um, what we are experiencing, I think, uh, is an effort at insurrection by other means um, in that uh, people have taken that big lie and used it around the country to disenfranchise people, particularly people of color, but also to strip independent elections officials of their duties and responsibilities and give them over to partisans. Um, this is, uh, as the president said, a dagger pointed at the heart of our democracy. Um, in terms of what we need to do about it, uh, in addition to the legislation that uh, Brad mentioned, um, and I would add the Protecting Our Democracy Act, which I have a proprietary interest in as well, our own set of post-Watergate reforms. Um, but in addition to that, uh, we really, I think, need a national awakening um, and recommitment to preserve our democracy. Uh, we have to protect independent elections officials who are being drummed out of their jobs and run out of town, sometimes with death threats. This has to be um, a grassroots uh, up as well as top down effort to save our democracy. We thought our democracy was inevitable, inexorable, immutable, uh, and we were wrong. Uh, it is vulnerable. It is precious. It is endangered. Uh, and we have to treat it that way. Um, so uh, there, there isn't a silver bullet here, um, but we do need to rally around this cherished legacy of our founders uh, and recognize it as something to be zealously guarded. Congressman, thank you. I know you're on a tight schedule. Um, I just wanna point out, I think anybody who watched the impeachment hearings and has listened to you on television or in person, realizes the way you present things is very simple and easy to understand. And that's so helpful in this environment where people don't give a lot of um, listen to, to what's being said or they take their, their information in sound bites. You do a very good job of explaining the importance of each one of these issues that you presented today. And you did so uh, in, in all the intelligence hearings and the impeachment as well. So uh, we wish you Godspeed, of course, uh, along with all of our other members that are uh, serving today and uh, talking to us today. But uh, it, it really is an important task uh, as we move forward over the next number of months. So continue the great work. Uh, thank you. And thank you for your great work. And so wonderful to see you, Rabbi. Uh, be well, everyone. Be safe. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, next, uh, next up, and, and uh, we are uh, so pleased to have uh, Representative Kathy Manning join us. Kathy is a, a new member from North Carolina's 6th Congressional District. This is our first term, and boy, has it been a term. Uh, Representative Manning, we thank you for being here as someone who has uh, taken uh, uh, a, a number of issues with, um, whether it's foreign affairs or other things. One thing you have been faced with personally is one of the fundamental problems in our system right now, and that is gerrymandering. And I know that some of the legislation that's being considered talks about that, but as someone who's been a victim of gerrymandering, can you share with us uh, how this works, how it worked in your state, and what are the consequences of gerrymandering? Absolutely. Thank you, Ron, for having me here. I want to thank everyone at JDCA for holding this event. I want to take a moment also to 
thank all of my colleagues on this call for welcoming me into Congress under these very difficult circumstances. I have to say I have relied on the guidance and the friendship of my Jewish colleagues. And um, some who you've had today have been among those who have been the most welcoming and really offered me guidance along the way. So I just want to mention that before we jump into the question of redistricting. Um, uh, there has been redistricting taking place all across the country because of the census. And North Carolina, I hate to say, but they seem to specialize in my state in gerrymandering. And the, the way I was able to get this seat to run in uh, in 2019 was there was a court case that, um, that uh, it was filed because the prior maps were such a terrible extreme partisan gerrymander. And um, the court determined that the gerrymander that had taken place in the prior maps violated the North Carolina state constitution, which like 32 other states has a provision in it requiring free and fair elections. This is actually a provision that's not in the US Constitution. And that's why the case was brought under the North Carolina State Constitution. Well, like all of, like so many other states, we, we have had redistricting and in North Carolina, we are gaining a seat. So we will go from 13 representatives to 14 representatives. Um, as a result, as I said, of the last election, we, of our 13 seats now have five Democrats and eight Republicans in a state that is truly purple, we actually have more registered Democrats than Republicans in the state of North Carolina. So our, our redistricting commission, this time it is controlled by the state legislature, which is controlled by the Republicans. Um, our governor does not have a veto. So despite the fact that there were ostensibly public hearings and public comment was taken into account, the Republicans drew maps that um, ensured that this uh, the, the of the 14 representatives that we will have uh, going forward, uh, there were 10, there would be 10 safe Republican seats, only three that were likely to be Democratic and one toss up. So even though we gain a seat in North Carolina, the way the Republicans have redrawn the maps, um, they we would actually lose a Democrat and that Democrat would be me because they came after my seat. They divided my district, the 6th District of North Carolina, into four different pieces um, to, to divide up all the Democrats in my area. We live in a Democratic county, Guilford County. And uh, they divided Guilford County into three pieces and took away the city of Winston-Salem. They drew my district across 10, or my portion of, of Guilford County across 10 other counties, grabbed a little divot of Watauga County, which is almost to Tennessee, so that they could draw in a Republican Virginia Fox um, so that she and I would be in the same district. That, um, that extreme partisan gerrymander has once again been challenged in the state court. Uh, the month of uh, December was kind of a roller coaster. The, the lower court uh, refused to, um, to stop the election. It went to a three judge panel of the Court of Appeals. They put a pause on the filing of by candidates saying that the maps were unfair. The full panel of the Court of Appeals started the election up against and uh, again and said the maps were fine. Then the North Carolina Supreme Court took control of the case. They postponed our primary, moving it from March to May. They sent the case back to the trial court for determination and retained control of the appeal. Uh, the, the arguments are being held in our trial court right now. They must be completed on the decision rendered by January 11th. The appeal will go to the North Carolina Supreme Court on January 13th. Uh, the good news is that the, um, the, court, the uh, Supreme Court has more Democrats than Republicans. I am optimistic because I do not believe that the Supreme Court would have postponed our, um, our uh, primary by two months and retained jurisdiction of the appeal unless they intended to make sure that we have fair maps under the North Carolina Constitution. Councilor, just share one more point with us. Talk about what this means to have these kinds of gerrymandered districts. I mean, the fact that people are disenfranchised in large numbers on both sides when this, when this happens. Explains what that means in terms of the outcome when you, when you show up in Washington and you're sitting there with people that are you know, voted in by extremes of the Republican party. And in some cases, people would argue the other side as well, but what does that mean in terms of actually getting things done? 
I think you've talked, you've touched on something that's very important, Ron, and that is not only are the voters in my district disenfranchised because all of the Democrats' votes are diluted when our district is divided up in so many different pieces and, and put with the rural Republican districts. So first of all, our, our, the votes are, um, have no meaning when we can't vote in meaningful districts. But the other issue is when you have these extremely partisan gerrymandered districts, what ends up happening is um, the most extreme candidates end up winning. And you end up with candidates who are really on the fringes uh, of where the American people are. We see that with some of our colleagues uh, in the House right now. We see some Republicans, and uh, I don't have to name them, but all of you know who they are. They, they um, some from my own state, some from nearby Georgia, they don't even hire legislative uh, assistants for their offices. They hire only communications people because their goal is not actually to legislate. Their goal is to promote their own brand and raise money by saying things that um, appeal to the most extreme members of their base. So it really, um, it really hurts the process of legislating and it also moves the representatives further away from where the American people are. I actually believe that the American people are much more in the middle, um, but what we end up with, when we have these gerrymandered, these extremely partisan gerrymandered district, we end up with representatives who don't represent mainstream America, they represent the extremes. Congresswoman, you said it all right there, and this applies obviously to state legislatures uh, as well as, as Congress. It's the same problem institutionally, and uh, this is a fundamental issue that needs to be addressed along with the voting rights general issues as well. So thank you for being part of this discussion today and your reflections. We wish you all the best and we stand fully behind you. Thank you. I'm now going to turn it over to our very special friend, Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Uh, Debbie is uh, a personal friend of her former colleagues from South Florida. She represents Florida's 23rd Congressional District. She was first elected in 2004, serves as a Cardinal on the Appropriations Committee, making history as the first woman ever to chair the Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Subcommittee. And with the exception of Congressman Schiff today, Representative Wasserman Schultz is the longest serving member on today's call. And so since at this point, I think Congresswoman, everyone wants to know, and you've been hearing from different members, what is it we can do? People are on pins and needles with what's going on in the country today. They've seen obviously what happened a year ago today and they wanna know how they can engage. Share with us if you can, you know, have you ever seen anything like this before? And more importantly, what can we do as individuals? What can we do through JDC or other organizations to maintain our democracy in the face of violent opposition and an entire political party that seems increasingly comfortable with authoritarianism? Thank you, Ron. Thank you for that important question. Um, and thank you for yours and your board's vision, and as well as your, your staffers, incre led incredibly by, uh, by Haley Seufer, um, for your vision for even creating the Jewish Democratic Council of America. Your existence is part of what we need to be able to utilize to be able to make sure that we can keep at bay the, the autocratic authoritarian extremists who one year ago today stormed our capital. And for me, I was locked down in this very space that, that, uh, that I am right now with sirens outside, uh, the bomb squad across the street, it was an incredible day of fear for many, um, one of anxiety, one of uncertainty, uh, but that fear morphed into resolve to act in defense of our democracy. And we have a duty. We had a duty that day, uh, which is why at three in the morning, I was in the chamber with my colleagues certifying the results of that free and fair election and making sure we had a, a peaceful transition to, uh, of power. Um, but throughout, that day throughout the entire former president's tenure and, and all the way through this past year, I have had reverberating in my head, my parents' notion that they would instill around our Jewish family dinner table, that it is our duty as Jews not to stand idly by. And, and that is the moral imperative that we have going forward today. I mean, there are, there are those in public life 
who continue to fan the flames of hatred, who peddle in conspiracy-laden lies and disinformation, and we have to name them and shame them, and we have to make sure they are sanctioned to the greatest extent possible. And that, on the official side, uh, is what we are going to do once we have the results of the very critical investigation that is being done by the House committee that is focused on the activities around uh, January 6th. And, uh, and with every passing day, more is revealed. But what I, what I want to share with this group here, and there are nearly 600 people on this call, so the exponential impact that we can have with our, act, act, with our activism cannot be understated. Please don't feel like your presence on this call today is enough. It is not. We have too many times when we feel like we've, we've done our part because we spent an hour on Zoom call uh, listening to important speakers talk about the challenges that we have in front of us. That is not enough. Frankly, that is slacktivism. And, and, and we all engage in a bit of slacktivism. Uh, we all spend a lot of time online, but liking posts on Facebook and retweeting uh, things that other people say, um, that, that, is, that is not activism. It is absolutely imperative that over the next 11 months and beyond, that you turn your slacktivism, and we're all guilty of it, into activism, human engagement. We need you to make sure that the actions that JDCA engages in, that you, that you take them up on in-person action even while keeping yourselves safe during the crisis that we're living through with the pandemic, it is absolutely essential that you think through. And I ask people, it's part of my New Year's resolution every year is to think through what can I do? What personal commitment can I make? Is it making sure that I spend at least a weekend a month or part of a weekend a month going door to door to talk about people's the importance of registering to vote? Uh, making sure that you can go out and ha have a parlor, have a parlor meeting with your neighbors, invite a local elected official that can talk about why it's so important that people register to vote, get involved in the political process, talk about why it's so important that we do everything we can to elect the right people so we can preserve our democracy. I, I think all of us throughout our whole existence took our democracy for granted. Well, a year ago today, but for the actions of a few people who had a couple of shreds of integrity left, we would have actually had an overthrow of a legitimate presidential election and the former president would have likely remained in office. Or, or, or if not, then I really shudder to think what would have happened if, if, if we didn't make sure that we had that peaceful transition of power. As Jews, we stand for justice. We value freedom. We understand the consequences when our precious rights are wrongfully taken from us. And it is our responsibility. We, we are instilled with a responsibility to act because we uniquely as a people know what it's like when our freedom is taken from us. And we, and we know and have witnessed and experienced the heinous rise in anti-Semitism. The January 6th insurrectionists were fueled by violent conspiracy theorists and white supremacy. They were unabashed in their anti-Semitism, even wearing clothing that said Camp Auschwitz or six million wasn't enough. And we need others to stand by us as well. So please, I would ask you at the conclusion of this event, please, Take a pen, pen and pad out. I know that's old school, but take out a pen and pad and, and write down a few ideas about what you can do to make a difference in our government and who runs it. And I'll just conclude, Ron, by saying this. I, I know for me, my, in my role as a member of Congress, I, I, I was absolutely stunned uh, at, the, at the activities of one year ago. Uh, we had people in our own body, who were part of the process of trying to overturn a, a, a presidential election. And we had an insurrection that took place on the grounds of this campus. And I know that I am committed to making sure that people who tried to overthrow our government can never be allowed to run it again. I, I will be filing legislation that will invoke the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution 
that would ensure that we disqualify these insurrectionists, whether they planned it or, or, or attempted to carry it out. So that's one, pe that, that, that's one piece that goes on my pad and a variety of other things will as well. And if you need, it, if you need assistance, reach out to JDCA. I know Haley and Ron could give you a very long list of the things that you can do to help us make sure that we never, uh, that, that we never turn backward uh, again, and that we can make sure that we elect people who support our democracy, not who undermine it. Well, Congressman you. Wasserman Schultz, that was uh, quite a sum up of uh, the purpose of today's call to reflect uh, and to take action. And uh, I would just want to point out to everybody, as, as uh, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz just mentioned, in our chat, we have the link to JDCA's Learn About How to Take Action 2022. Uh, through JDCA, and we certainly welcome ideas. And uh, this is about education. This is about activity. This is about reaching out. And as uh, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz correctly said, this is not just about uh, you know using social media. This is in person. People have to understand their personal responsibility. So when they go to the ballot box in 2022, they understand what is at stake. This is not something theoretical. This is what is literally at stake in 2022 and leading up to 2024. Who's in charge? Who will be making decisions on who, how the electoral college plays out? It could be a whole different group of people uh, unless we do what we need to do to maintain control of the House and the Senate. So thank you, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz for bringing that uh, together for us. I also wanna uh, thank all of our uh, speakers today, our members of Congress and, and friends who, who spoke to us. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rabbi Sharon Browse to uh, bring it together for us. All right. Thank you so much, Ron. And uh, to Representative Wasserman Schultz, amen, amen. Uh, we thank you. We're closing in just a moment. As we close today, I really just want to invite us to hold an image. Uh, this is an image that was written decades ago by a rabbi named Shalom Noach Berezovsky, who's known as the Slonim Rebbe. He's a survivor of a Hasidic dynasty that was essentially wiped out in the Holocaust. And this is the image. He says, when we build a home, a person must invest in a deep and pure foundation. If he fails to do so, if he chooses instead to build on a rotten foundation, the house might stand for some time. It may even appear from the outside to be strong and sturdy, but eventually, invariably, cracks will begin to appear in the walls, hints of breaches in the structure. And I think about that image all the time. I think about that house built on a rotten foundation. I imagine the owner of the house trying to ignore the cracks when they begin to appear. But once the neighbors start talking, he furiously tries to paint and plaster over the cracks. He's desperate to maintain the appearance of normalcy. The problem is that the more he tries to conceal, the more clear it becomes that they're in trouble. All the house owner wants is for things to be as they've always been. Nothing to see here right? When some of the residents in that house start to point out that the cracks are appearing because the house was built on an unsound foundation, that just enrages the homeowner. He accuses them of endangering the house, even when it's clear that all they really want to do is rectify the problem and make the space safer for everybody. The worse shape the house is in, the more desperate the homeowner becomes. He creates all kinds of diversions and distractions, even as his own house threatens to collapse on him. Do you see what's happening here? The homeowner's unwillingness to acknowledge the depth of the problem, the rotten foundation, actually endangers the whole edifice, threatening to take down everyone inside. Eventually, we learn that the only path forward is to clean out the rotten foundation and build something new, something strong, and pure and healthy. What happened a year ago today in our nation's capital was shocking, but it was also inevitable because the cracks have been forming in the walls of our shared home for many, many years. And the obfuscation had reached a fevered pitch. Anything not to admit the truth that this place, this place of so much promise for my family and for so many other people was rooted in so much pain that the rot at the foundation of our nation is the heresy of white supremacy. That ideology which manifested in so many ways over the years from enslavement to Jim Crow to mass incarceration, but rarely has it appeared more doggedly and more consistently than in attempts at voter suppression, whether through poll taxes, voter erasure, felony disenfranchisement, gerrymandering, or the Electoral College. The cracks in the walls are the fissures in our society today. 
making this a time not only of fierce polarization, but of grave distrust and the growing threat of political violence in our time. And instead of doing the hard work of truth telling, reckoning and reparation, some people, many people have chosen to tell a big intoxicating lie rather than finally confront the truth of the past, rather than lay the foundation for the new America that is being born now, ready or not, that lie was told and retold until it swept the nation. This lie came from the gutter, but it was repeated by leaders and people with real power and influence. And many of the people who held and still hold tight to this lie call themselves religious, despite the fact that the very definition of idolatry is treating a lie like the deepest truth. This is a lie, not only about our past. This is a lie that has grave implications for the future. On January 6, 2021, this lie endangered the lives of many of the people you've heard from today. And now, a year later, it's a lie that more than 21 million Americans are willing to take up arms to defend. A lie that political leaders across the country are scrambling to mirror in legislation designed to strip the people of their basic rights in a democracy, the right to vote. The lie is the rot that's eating away at the foundation of our shared home. And a rotten foundation can be fixed, but only when the inhabitants are prepared to do the hard work. We have to remember the choice now is not between action and inaction. It's between life and death, democracy and fascism, healing and total collapse. How we proceed in the days ahead matters profoundly. I pray that the house does not collapse on our heads. I fervently believe that it's not too late for us. I also know that what we do now matters. Our house is being torn apart at the seams and the people are crying out for decisive action. This is a plea to those in power to do everything you can to demand a reckoning. Let us clean out the rotten foundation and together build a foundation that is clean and pure and built for us all. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Rabbi Browse, for those words. And thank you to all of our guests for joining us today. And to all of you at home, as we mark the one year anniversary of the Capitol siege and unlawful insurrection against the United States of America. Again, I'm Bobby Saferstein, JDCA's Director of Programming and Strategy. And it seems unfathomable that what we witnessed happen last year at the hands of an authoritarian president and his followers could happen here but with the fissures and fractures in our foundations festering for so long, as Rabbi Browse just mentioned, of course it did. As Jewish Americans, we know what happens when this occurs in other parts of the world and throughout our history. And as we've so poignantly heard today, we must do everything we can to protect and safeguard our, our democracy every single day. We hope you'll take action with JDCA by visiting our website at jewishdems.org and joining our five-part action plan. While there, you'll learn about all the ways you can support JDCA in programs like these, how to become a JDCA member, and how to join one of our 16 state and local chapters made up of grassroots volunteers. The 2022 midterm elections are less than one year away. We have no time to lose in organizing our communities and ensuring that Jewish voters help elect Democrats who reflect our values. With extremely narrow Democratic majorities in the House and Senate, JDCA will be engaging more activists, reaching more voters, and impacting more races to maintain and expand our majority, majorities. What kind of government have you given us? Benjamin Franklin was asked after a session of the Constitutional Convention. A democracy, he replied, if you can keep it. As we close out today's program, I'd like to ask that we take a moment to mark what we came so close to losing and to honor all those who were affected and continue to be affected by the needless violence of that day. Then I invite you to join me in singing Olam Chesed Yibaneh, I Will Build This World From Love by Rabbi Menachem Creditor and reciting the prayer for our country. Oh, 
Allah eseri banne Yaraday 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 day Allah eseri banne Yaraday 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 day Allah eseri banne Yaraday, 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 yaraday. Allah me khasir hibane. Yaraday, 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 yaraday. I will build this world from love. Yaraday, 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 yaraday. And you must build this world from love. Yaraday, 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 yaraday. And if we build this world from love, yaraday, 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 yaraday. Then God will build this world from love. Yaraday, 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 yaraday. A prayer for our country. Source of life, bless this country and all who dwell within it. Help us to experience the blessings of our lives and circumstances. To not take for granted the freedoms won in generations past or in recent days. And to heal and nourish our democracy. Guide our leaders with righteousness that they may use their influence and authority to speak truth and act for justice. May we be strong and have courage to be bold in our action and deep in our compassion, to uproot bigotry, intolerance, and violence in all its forms, and to celebrate the many faces of the divine reflected in humanity. <laughs> Yaraday, 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 yaraday. Olam chaser yibane. Yaraday, 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 yaraday. Olam chaser yibane. Yaraday, 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 yaraday. Allah me khasir hi banne Yaraday, 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 yaraday Together may we build a world of love and action and let us say amen. Thank you for joining us here at JDCA today. Wishing you all an early Shabbat Shalom and we'll see you soon. Goodbye everyone.